Praise God, church. Hey, so we're going through 1 Peter, uh, this letter Peter wrote to a church that included Jews and Gentiles, which is all of us. And we looked at the places in um, Turkey where this letter was written to. And so, uh, you know, last week, just to revisit, we, we, we titled this series, A Believer's Time Machine. And, and the reason is, is because God has put truth into our past. He has given us a new present, and he has given us a new future. And so what we are called to do is to take comfort in going into our past, looking into our future, and knowing who we are today. And the more we travel into our future, in our past, you know, people say, don't live, like, don't, the past is the past. We don't believe that. We believe that all reality that God has given us is for our benefit. So last week, we talked about how, you know, oftentimes we have cluttered pasts. That means there's good stuff and bad stuff that we have in our lives. And that uh, in the present moment, there's a lot of confusion. Like, who, who are we as Christians? Who am I as a person? And in the future, it's a lot oftentimes chaotic and World War III and global warming, if you're, I don't know if you're a believer. But that's kind of the past and future and present, but that we're focusing in on a Christ-focused past. It's going past our past to an event when Jesus died for us and to an event when God foreknown us. And in the present moment, we have a Christ-given present. And in the future, we have a Christ-assured future. And so last week, if you remember, this is what we took from the text, that in the past, God has foreknown us and loved us. And in the present moment, we are exiles. An exile is somebody who is living in a country that's not their home. So it doesn't matter if you were born here. It doesn't matter, you know, where, where you're a citizen. Ultimately, you have been made an exile. Jesus basically snuck in and on your identity changed your address to heaven. And that's where you belong and an inheritance. So... Today, and, and last week we talked about suffering, but today we're going to talk about conduct. So these are the two themes in Peter, suffering and conduct, behavior, how to live life. Last week we focused in on suffering. Today we'll talk about conduct as you'll see it comes up. So uh, 13, verse 13, chapter 1, verse 13, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 13 through 25, we'll go through it. So let's read it. I was told last week that I rushed through the reading of the text which is the most important part of the sermon. So today, we're going to slow down and take in the passage, the truth, and the stuff God has blessed us. Therefore, that therefore follows all of that stuff, that we have an inheritance, that we are exiles, and that God has loved us. He died for us. We are saved. Uh, we got to love him more, believe in him. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. If you're wondering what that means, you're wondering the right thing. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, that means he doesn't have favorites, according to each one's deeds, conduct, again, yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, or or just Christ, I made that up, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Smaller text. 
in the last few text verses. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So just as the word of the Lord remains forever, your birth, which comes from that word, is also forever your life. And this word is good news that was preached to you. So let's start with the first verse. It says this. Therefore, be, there's three things here in this verse. Preparing your, and before we get to the present, past, and future, Peter wants us to just kind of get these three things down. First of all, preparing your minds for action. Our faith is actionable faith. This means that for every reality that is in the Bible, every truth that you proclaim, celebrate, there is an action that goes with it. I don't know if there's one truth that God has given us that doesn't ask something of us in our Monday life, in our ordinary life. I was even thinking about the Trinity. And the Trinity is huge for our lives because Trinity is the best example we have of a community because it is the only community that is perfect unity without uniformity. It is the only unity between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's perfect and they're not the same. So there's not a lot of truth out there that's not actionable. But here's another thing. Faith is not only something that we take action for and we got to get and start doing stuff. But faith must have action. Have you ever worked out? Nobody has worked out. Anyway, I'll tell you guys from experience, (laughs) uh, long experience. But when you work out and you build muscle. And you stop and you build, you know, however many guns as you want, you know. And you are like buff and ripped. Well, here's the thing. The only way to keep your muscle or to grow muscle, what do you need to do? Work out. Keep working out. Language. The only way to have a language, know the language, speak the language is to what? Be in situations where you use it. Faith is like that. Unless faith becomes action, unless faith becomes doing stuff, faith becomes dead. Listen, there's more than one way to kill your faith. It's not only not having a devotional life. That will do it too. But it is also not doing anything with it. And when we come to church like this, we sing so many truths. We believe so many truths. But where is that corresponding action? And that action is so important because, listen, if you believe, for example, that God is in control, you surrender your anxiety. If you believe that God, Jesus, is Lord, then you say no to certain entertainment choices. And you believe God is enough, you are generous And when that happens, that action is evidence and it encourages us and it confirms for us that I do believe this stuff. It's not just a matter of the heart. It's not just a matter of perspective, but it is actionable faith. So that's first. Be sober-minded. Now, sober-minded here is not about drunkenness or alcohol. It's speaking here of having clarity, knowing who you are, knowing what is true. And there's, in this day, and I don't know if there's voices in your head, in your life, that are full of lies. And you need clarity. And you have voices in your head that tell you that you're not loved, you're not important, that you'll be alone, you'll die alone. If you want God to love you, you got to do this. There are voices in our heads that tell us, if you could just get that thing or that achievement or that kind of makeover in your life, you will be loved. You will be special. God is mad at you. God doesn't love you and so forth. And what we do as followers of Jesus, we have clarity of who we are, of our inheritance, of God's love for us. And the third thing is notice it says, set your hope fully 
on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The hope is for the future and the full gr- hope is only for the re- grace that will be brought. In other words, for heaven and when we meet Jesus. I notice, and tell me if this is not your life maybe, but oftentimes we want to double dip. We have hope for this life. Lots of hope. And we have Lots of hope for the future. And I brought a little quick example. But here I have two glasses. And what's interesting is we can sometimes put hope. And this glass is earthly life. And this glass is heavenly life. And what I realized is often we split our hope seeking satisfaction hoping to get every bit of satisfaction from this life, and when we're done with this life, we'll be ready for this life. And so every joy, every thrill, every excitement, we're going to try to get everything we can, and we're just going to drink it. We're just going to keep drinking. Every satisfaction I can get, every joy I can get out of this life, every thrill, every excitement I can get out of this life, And the goal is to get everything I can out of this life, including every drop. And when I have drunk from this life, every satisfaction, pleasure, convenience, joy, thrill, excitement, a full life, I'll be ready for heavenly life. Now, here's the problem with this idea. Here's what happens when our hope is split, do double dipping, is that when I have this life, We're just going to borrow from heaven a little bit. But if my goal is to get everything out of this life that I can, then here are a couple of things that happens. First of all, I start looking at other people. And I'm like, wait a moment. You have way more fun than I do. I get despair. And what happens when God comes and takes a little bit of this away from my life? I get bitter. And then... When God calls me to sacrifice, there's no way I'm sacrificing my time, my money, my joy, my convenience. Because the goal of life and the hope that I have is to get as much satisfaction out of this as possible. So there's no way you can talk to me about sacrifice. You know what we do? We abandon this hope for this life, satisfaction from this life. And we put it to earthly life. With this life... We take what God gives us, and he'll give us joy. He gives us enjoyment. But you know what? I look around, and some people are traveling the world. But I don't get to travel the world, but I'm happy with what God has given me. And should God want to swoop in and take some joy out of my life, something that I find dear, that's fine. God gives, God takes away. And should God call me, and he does call me, to take some of this joy, such, some of this convenience, some of this money, some of this time, and bless somebody else, I'm fine. Because my hope is here. The hope of satisfaction is here. Here I take what God has given me and give what God requires of me. And the God does give us enjoyment. But my hope is set fully on the grace that will be through Jesus. Amen? So, being, preparing our minds for action, being sober-minded, setting our hope fully on the grace that will come, we get to our time machine. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, let me ask you this. What is our identity? Who are we? Children. We are children. We have been adopted to a new family, and God is our father. And here's the thing. If God is our father, then what do the children do? Who, what is our family about? Have you noticed how oftentimes whatever the father does, the children do? So in this church, we have a family by the name of Horokovskis. Their dad was a building engineer. Their first son became a building engineer, Andre. Second son, Vitaly, the drummer, became a building engineer. 
The third son, Peter, became a building engineer. Why? Because family, kids, do what their father did. My dad, he works with granite and rock. And literally, anytime somebody knows my dad but doesn't know me, gets to know me, they always assume I'm in, I do granite. In fact, this Wednesday, I was talking to somebody, and they're like, oh, so, so what do you do, you do granite? And I, I mean, I would love to, but I don't. Now, Sergi, my brother, and Andre, my brother, got swallowed in. And they're granite workers. The reason is, is because children do what their father does. And now, this is true in life. But if we are children of a heavenly father, what do we do? Our God's family's business is holiness. The family that God has made his own and adopted to be his own is holy. Like the Father, we are holy. And so when we do not pursue holiness in our life, we are acting out of character. We're acting out of our, that's our, that's our code. That's our DNA. That's what we're about. That's what we expect of each other. That's what we should be known by. Our Father, what's He doing? What's He about? Well, He's perfectly holy. So what do children do? We pursue holiness. It says so here. Notice how it goes quickly. As obedient children, be holy because he who called you is holy. Now, I know you're asking me, what is holiness? What is this thing? That's such a religious term. Like, I don't even like hearing this. How can I be holy? How am I to pursue holiness? How am I to be holy like God is holy? So I'm going to, I have a really crazy diagram. That line is world's ways. That's how the world thinks, does its business, the values it has, the goals it sets, the pursuit it goes after, the methods it uses, its heart, it's the world's ways of doing things. Holiness is this. It means to be separate from that line to be separate from the way the world does things. So if world's ways are here, holiness is separate. And here's God's ways. Holiness means being set apart. And there are two ways of doing life. There's two ways that run through this universe. There's the world's ways, and we'll talk about that, sinful ways, destructive ways, and then there is God's ways, which is set apart. That space, anytime you get that space, that's called holiness. Anytime you get that separation from the way the world does, it's called holiness. And do you know where we are? So we're called to be holy, but where are we on this map? Well, number one, we are here. We are holy already. We are perfectly holy at this point. This is called positional holiness. And every person who believes in Jesus, the Bible says that you are now in Christ. And as Christ is, so you are. And as Christ is righteous, so are you. That's where you're at right now. At the same time, you are here in world's ways. And what you're supposed to do and what we're called to do, it's called progressive holiness. And notice how we're here. My hand is shaking. And we're here. We're here. We're already holy. And we're actually not very holy. But what are we supposed to do? What is life about? This line is perfect righteousness. This line is called being like Jesus. This line is called God's standards. And this line is, you know, everything else that we know of. And we are positionally already holy. But we're also down here at the same time. And here's what we do. We're on a journey. We're on 
a journey. And this journey is called sanctification. And let, let me show you, we're saved because of this. Because we are right here, perfectly holy in Christ. And at the same time, because we're here and in our lives, with our hearts, with our sins, with our in the burdens of life, we're also here and we are moving on up. And we're becoming like Christ. I want you to know something. Both are important. Some Christians forget about this part and they only worry about this and as if they're saved by this. And some Christians don't worry about this part because you're over here. But both are true. Both realities are true. And the reason why we can progress, the reason why we got to become sanctified, the reason why we got to become more like Christ is because this is the outcome of personal holiness. If you are saved and you are in Christ and you are seated in Christ and you are in righteous as he is, then the outcome, the fruit of that tree is going to be ever growing and pursuit of holiness. And if there is no progressive holiness in your life, then it only means that this is not really a reality. And I want to tell you that everybody is at different parts of this journey. Some people are really ahead. Some people are really behind. Some people have fallen. Some people have hit a dry spell. Some people are getting back up. But he, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. The main trend of our lives is to become more and more like Christ. So what we have here is a picture that we are to be holy like our Father is holy because that's what children do. And what gives us, it gives us two contrasts. And one day, sorry, when we die, we'll be perfectly made whole. Not because death is powerful. Not because death makes us righteous. But because death simply transitions us to a place where we are fully God's. And he completes that work in us. And one day, we will not only be positionally holy, but we will be also actually holy. Amen? So now, we have two versions of living life. I just want to tell you from this passage what does it mean now specifically to be like the Father? What does it mean like to live in a family that's God's family? It's interesting that in this passage, Peter would highlight two things, two families, a world family and a God's family. And world's family used to live like their forefathers did. And a God's family now lives like their father. There's two things here, that what this means for holiness. First one is, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The world's ways of doing things is to live like they please. To live like they desire. To live like however they want to. Now, God's family, to be holy, means not just stopping, conforming to our passions of former ignorance, but it means also starting to conform to God's desires, God's wishes for our life. Holiness is when we conform, we stop to conform to our old sinful desires and start conforming to God's desires. What this means is holiness is not just big, big, big religious, mega term, mega concept reserved for the elite special team Christians, for pastors, for somebody else. No, holiness means it's a calling of every single child of God to be like the Father, meaning conforming to His desires which means that holiness is in every choice you make. Holiness is a possibility in every decision you make. When you are tempted to lust with your eye, your heart, your mind, your phone, you stand there with a decision, do I want to be like the Father? Or do I want to give in 
to worldly desires. When you are tempted and in a moment, when you want to act out on your anger and say the sharp thing and say the thing you don't want to say, stands before your choice. Do you want to be like the Father and cover with love, show light, or do you want to conform to passions and desires? When you stand there and scroll into social media and you're tempted to covet somebody's husband, somebody's wife, somebody's looks, somebody's car, somebody's travel, stands before your choice. Do you want to give in to that? Or do you want to be holy like the Father and say, God, you are enough? When you are tempted to be bitter, stands before you a choice of holiness. Do you want to be like the Father? Conforming to his wishes or to your former sinful wishes. The second thing it means for us is loving one another. Peter also talks about how holiness is loving one another. Now, here's the thing. Like, if you and I, have you ever, and and this is a weird question, and as I was planning to say this, I was thinking, man, this may be kind of creepy. But look at this. Love one another earnestly from a pure Heart. Have you ever looked at a brother or a sister in this church and just thought to yourself, man, I love this guy. I don't mean to be weird, but you love this guy. You love your brother. You love your sister. And what that means is not like some romantic feelings. What that means is, man, I, I want the best for you. Mark, I want the best for you. And should there be a need that I can help with to help you further along to that best, which is God's best, I'm all in. That's what children in God's family do. Now, children in the world's family, they don't do this. In fact, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. They can love and they love one another from an impure heart, meaning I got to use you. I'll flatter you, I'll gossip about you, I'll lie to you. I got to use you and you don't really matter. Or hate one another from an impure heart. And there's so much hate. I was uh, on Twitter the other day and I went through, I just want to show you. I don't know what you think about social media, but social media to my mind has really shown just how ugly our former passions and desires can be. In 2016, a boy, a three-year-old boy, fell into a gorilla pen, if you remember. His name was Haram or Harambe or something like that. I forgot. And what happened was he was in a zoo, and a three-year-old boy fell into the enclosure. And so what they ended up going is they ended up shooting the gorilla, killing the gorilla to save the baby. And on Twitter, can I just read just the hate that goes on? Here's the hate that was directed at the mom of the boy because a gorilla died. Now I want to say that that's really sad that a gorilla died, but hear this out. Here's one tweet to the mom. I hope you stop reproducing garbage like yourself. Another tweet. Deserves the worst parent and worst person of the year. The IQ of that beautiful gorilla was probably higher than yours. And there was one tweet that says, can we all just forgive a mother and be grateful her son is alive today? And I went on the responses. And they were just, not when an innocent life was taken. Would you forgive a rapist? Now, how crazy is that? And I know what you're thinking to me, Eugene. Um, that doesn't represent humanity, and I agree with you. This is a bad sample. But if you're on Twitter ever, any big news that are out there, and you just see the hate, let me ask you this. What do you think right now? How do you respond to these people? Are you responding with anger and hate right now? Do you hate the haters? Do you wish on them what they, these people, wished on the mom? 
Or do you wish them what God wishes them? What is God's wish for these people? The Bible says that God desires that they would be saved. Do you respond with, I can't believe this and I, I can't, and I hate you? Or do you respond with what God responds and says, I have compassion and I wish you would know me. I desire that you would know me. But here's the thing. There's hate in this world and there's love from an impure heart. But we as a family love one another earnestly with a pure heart and love the world. That's what it means to be holy. Is when we do not conform to our sinful passions, but conform to our Father's desires. And we love one another earnestly with a pure heart. So, there you go. Our, we are children, and we are to be holy like the Father is. And then it says this, if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, con conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Here's the second thing. In the future, we have judgment. Judgment. God will judge us in the future. And because that will happen, we have all the more reason to co conduct ourselves holy. Now, are you ever confused by judgment? Like, what does this mean? What does judgment mean? Like, are we, aren't we just, get, don't we just have a getaway card, a jail getaway free card, like God forgives all of our sins? Now, here's the thing. The Bible tells us that God will judge everyone according to each other's deeds. And this is so important, and we need to talk about this. And what this means is, yes, when we stand before God on that last, last day, if we're standing there before God, God will bring up our deeds. The beautiful thing is for every believer when all of the failures, all of the mistakes, all of the sins, all of the shortcomings, all of the weaknesses, all the things that we have done and do and will do in our life, they will be brought before us from God. But furthermore, behind every sin, they will be forgiven. Forgiven. Not because we're so nice, but because we are in Christ. And Jesus has died for that sin. But that does not remove the fact that we will stand there and give an account for the way we did life. And although we will be forgiven for every sin and we will yet still hear and give an account, I want you to know something. Just because the outcome is a really, really favorable one does not mean that the process is not a painful one. Just because we know that all of our sins are forgiven does not mean that standing there will be easy. And that our sins are no, it's a trifle. It's a small thing. It's a trivial thing. Because when we stand there, there will be pain, but also joy. But there will be that pain. And we stand there before God. You know what I think? When we hear our sins, our shortcomings, and we will have to give an account, we will hear, hear our sins, hear our failures, and think, man, and Jesus had to die for that sin. We will hear our failures, our mistakes, and think, man, how foolish I was to not care. We will hear our failures and God will tell us this and we'll give an account for this and we will think, man, I wish I had a redo. How I wish I could redo that argument I had with my wife or husband. How I wish I could redo that situation or that conversation where I gossiped. How I wish I wouldn't be so selfish with time and money. How I wish I could redo that moment when I gave in to lust. How I wish I could redo that moment when I compared myself and coveted, how I wish I could redo that moment when I gave in to bitterness. Now, I want to say that every sin is forgiven. But on judgment day, it doesn't mean, God, we will not stand there to give an account. And I think on that day, we will really finally feel 
the weight of our sins and the weight of Jesus' work. And we will rejoice that we're forgiven, but we will give an account. And I want to say that it does not make it any less, the fact that we're forgiven. Well, a lot less it means, but it doesn't mean it won't be painful. If a, you came to, if a doctor told, told you you had cancer, and the doctor also said, by the way, it's going to cost a lot of money, but this cancer is 100% curable. Now, there's joy that this is curable. doesn't mean it's not painful to go through that. And although our outcome is perfect, and we're going to be forgiven, doesn't mean there's any pain and wish and a desire to have lived differently. And so this judgment concept, it's not mine, it's right here. And I want to tell you, every sin matters. And I know that we have this idea that, look, if I'm forgiven, if I've done a thousand sins, a thousand and one sins, what's the matter with that? I want to say that, that matters. Every sin has weight. And, you know, when we, I, I don't know if you watch sports, but if you ever watch sports, sometimes we see like a contract. A, a player got a contract from a team. And it's like six years, $121 million. And then another player gets six years and 120 20 million dollars and you're thinking like same difference 121 million 120 million what's the difference 1 million let me ask you this does 1 million dollar matter it does it does how much does it matter a whole 1 million dollars and that's the difference between 121 and 120 which means to say that x amount of sins matters and x minus one amount of sins is even better a whole sin better amen so we see here that we are children called to be holy that we will stand giving an account for our deeds and the last part knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your fathers not with perishable things such as gold or silver but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Here's the last part of our reality. That in the past, Jesus bought us. And he didn't buy us with gold or silver, but he bought us with his precious blood. So in your past is not just the stuff you did, but there's a greater past when Jesus purchased you. And the point of this passage is to show how valuable you are. Like, I get excited when I, somebody buys coffee for me. I get excited when I get a gift from someone. We love when people sacrifice something for us. And what Peter is demonstrating here in these two verses is no price greater than this could be paid to purchase you. There is no greater price than the price that Jesus gave to purchase you. And purchase you for what? To purchase you from feudal ways for holy ways. Jesus has purchased you from feudal ways, sinful ways, old ways, old passions for holy ways. To be like the Father. And no greater price was could be paid. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with this three-part reality. Our conduct is supposed to be a holy one, meaning we conform to God's desires. And we are able to do this because we are children and part of God's family. And knowing just how serious this is, knowing in two ways how serious it is, because number one, we will give an account for all of these deeds, and number two, because Jesus paid with his precious blood. Amen? So here, we're going to pray right now. 
I want to just say this. We come with faith. We always come with faith to God. We repent. If somebody hasn't believed in Jesus at all, or you're not sure where you stand, or you don't really have a life that has evidence to confirm your faith, today can change that. Today you can change that. Today you can trust in Jesus. And for all of us who do believe, let us align ourselves with these God-given truths so that tomorrow and Sunday and Monday, when we go to work, when we go to schools, when we go to colleges, when we go to Starbucks, when we go to grocery stores, when we're at home and we're driving in the car, wherever we are, we're always making that choice, the holiness choice. God, I want to be like you. I am your child. Jesus, God, you have modeled for me what love looks like. You have modeled for me what turning the other cheek looks like. You have modeled for me what returning love when hate is given. You have modeled for me purity and overcoming temptations and being victorious. You have modeled for me how to be a husband who loves his church and dies for her. You have modeled for me how to love people. You have modeled for me. So God, let me help me make the holy choice to be like you as I am a child. Stand with me and pray. Jesus, thank you so, so much for everything. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you have died for us and thank you that you have given us your word. Lord, you have made us your children. And the family of yours is defined by holiness. It is defined by conforming and doing what you wish that we would do. So I pray that you would help us, forgive us for our past, and help us conform. Help us be holy. Help us pursue holiness. We thank you that you have positionally made us holy, and right now, this moment, we are holy in you, but we also are called to live this out, to work this out in our life. So Jesus, I love you. I thank you. I pray for our forgiveness. We thank you for that. We pray that anybody who doesn't know you would place their faith in you right now. You will be under with, their, with them in their hearts. In your name I pray, amen.